The seventh video in Complex Numbers starts to look at some applications, and here we look at square roots. So previous videos showed how multiplication and division of complex numbers is easy in exponential form. We also showed that complex numbers can be considered as scaling and rotation operators. Here we're going to start looking at an application of the Mavris theorem which is something I know many of you find confusing. And in particular, we're going to look at how we can use this theorem to find roots. We're going to begin with square roots. Now, first, some background, just to remind you what you've done in the previous videos. What we said is if you have two complex numbers, so here you'll notice I've got a complex number r e to the i theta and another one b e to the i phi. If I multiply them together, then the result we have the modulus of the result is the product of the moduli, and the phase of the result is the sum of the phases. And that's the result that we need for this video. So what about square roots? Now, it's important you understand what we mean when we use the term square root. So here's an example. If I said, what's the square root of 9, you'd probably all write down straight away, oh, it's plus or minus 3. Or the square root of 121 is plus or minus 11. But why is that? OK, what I think you need to do is think of this in what I call an inverse way. It's a bit like inverse functions. Define the square root to be x. And then x is the correct square root if x squared equals the original number. So what we're actually saying is x is the square root of 9 if x squared equals 9. So those two expressions are equivalent. And similarly, x is the square root of 121 if x squared equals 121. So what we're going to say is when you get asked to do a square root operation, don't use this expression. Use these expressions here, because it makes life a little bit easier. So it's easier to say, think of a number that, if squared, gives the result you need. So here's an example. Find the square root of 12.25. And we're going to do this by iteration. So first of all, what we're saying is we want to find a number such that when we square it, we get 12.25. So x squared equals 12.25. So let's do some trial and error. We'll try x equals 3. Well, 3 squared equals 9. Clearly, that's not right. Let's try 4. Well, 4 squared equals 16. Clearly, that's not right. But one of those was too small and one was too big. So I'm going to try a number in the middle. And if you try 3.5 squared, you get 12.25. And therefore, you know that a possible answer is x equals 3.5. Now, of course, there are also some negative solutions. So it's well known that the product of two negative numbers is a positive number. So for example, if I'm trying to solve x squared equals 9 or x squared equals 121, I could do that by saying let x equals minus 3, because then x squared is indeed 9. Or let x equals minus 11, and then indeed x squared equals 121. So what does this tell me? It tells me that there are two possible solutions for the square root of a positive number. So if I say to you, find x such that x squared equals a, where a is a positive number, then there are two solutions. So you'll see here, the square root of 49, or in other words, solve x squared equals 49, and my two solutions are x equals plus or minus 7. And similarly, if I was doing x squared equals 81, my two solutions are x equals plus or minus 9. So now what we want to do is make the link back to complex numbers, because by doing this, you'll develop a skill you need when we want to solve problems that are more difficult than the square root. Right then, square roots with complex numbers. So what we're trying to do is solve this problem here. x squared equals a, which we said is equivalent to x equals the square root of a. And what we're going to do is write numbers in the exponential form as complex numbers. So I'm going to say, let x equal r e to the i theta. So that's written as a complex number. And I want to solve x squared equals 
16. Now you'll notice there's a subtle difference here. I've now got two unknowns, r and theta. Now the next thing I need to do is express all numbers in this equation in their exponential form. So let's do that. So you'll see we've got x squared, and that's going to be r squared e to the i 2 theta, and that's where de Mavra's theorem comes in. And similarly, I can write 16 as 16 e to the i 0, because the phase is 0, or equivalently, and this is really, really critical, I could write it as 16 e to the i 2 pi. Or indeed, I could also do 16 e to the i 4 pi, and so on. Next, what we're going to do is say, let's equate the modulus and phase on each side. So you'll notice, if I use a different color, we're trying to solve x squared equals 16. We've just said that x squared equals r squared e to the i 2 theta. We've just said that 16 equals 16 i to the 0, or 16 e to the i 2 pi. So now, if we look at the moduli, we'll see the moduli on one side is r squared, the moduli on the other side is 16. The phase on one side is 2 theta. The phase on the other side is 0, or 2 pi. So what do we get? We find out that r squared equals 16. That's from equating the moduli. And then if we equate the phase, we get 2 theta equals 0, or 2 theta equals 2 pi, or 2 theta equals 4 pi, and so on. So. Summarizing our solution, we find that r equals 4, and theta equals naught, or pi, or 2 pi, or so on. So what I'm going to do now is put those numbers back into the definition for x to get the final solution. So this is what we had on the previous page. We said that x was given as r e to the i theta, and we, knew, we found out what r was. r had to be 4. We found out what theta was. It had to be 0 or pi or 2 pi. So I'm simply going to plug those numbers into this expression here. And this is what I get. x equals 4 e to the i 0, or 4 e to the i pi, or 4 e to the i 2 pi, or 4 e to the i 3 pi, and so on. And you'll notice there's an infinite number of possibilities. If I now solve for e to the i 0, e to the i pi, and so on, then what you'll find is these solutions reduce to 4, minus 4, 4, minus 4, 4, minus 4, and so on. So they're repeating. And because we're looking for square roots, we know there are only two unique solutions. So I only need to take the two different ones here. Now, let's have a look at the link to polynomial roots, because this can be useful. If I'm trying to solve x squared equals 16, I could equally write x squared minus 16 equals 0. And you'll notice that's now written as a standard polynomial. And of course, you can factorize that using standard methods. So x squared minus 16 gives you x minus 4, x plus 4. And what do you notice? You've got a root at plus 4 and minus 4, the same as on the previous page. Right, now we need to move on to the more difficult problems. What about the square root of a negative number? And what we want to do is try this technique of using the exponential forms again. So I need to solve x equals the square root of minus 4. But what we've said before is don't do that. First of all, do a sort of inverse problem where you say, let's try and find an x so that when you square it, the result is minus 4. So I'm going to try and solve x squared equals minus 4. What I'm going to do to do this is first write x in exponential form. So there it is. I write x as r e to the i theta. And therefore, x squared is r squared e to the i 2 theta. And I'm going to try and set this equal to 4. But the next step, of course, is I also need to express the minus 4 in complex exponential form. So this is what we've done here. We said you can write minus 4 as 4 e to the i pi. Or you could write it as minus 4 equals 4 e to the minus i pi. You'll notice there's two 
clear possibilities here. And indeed, you could also do 4e to the i3 pi and 4e to the i5 pi and so on. The next step was to equate both sides. So we had x squared equals minus 4. So where we had x squared, I've written r squared e to the i 2 theta. And where we had minus 4, I've written 4e to the i pi. Alternatively, same for the x squared, r squared e to the i 2 theta. And for the minus 4, I could have put 4e to the minus i pi. And then you'll remember the step was equate the moduli, equate the phases. So what I'm going to do is equate the r squared and the 4. And I'm going to equate the 2 theta and the pi, or the 2 theta and the minus pi. So there we go. You find that r equals 2, and theta has to be pi by 2, or minus pi by 2. So let's summarize that on this page here. So what we've just said is the first lines are the same. If we assume that x has the form r e to the i theta, then we found that the value that r needed to take was 2, and the value theta needed to take was pi by 2 or minus pi by 2. And indeed, you could find a whole plethora of other solutions, 3 pi by 2 or minus 3 pi by 2, and so on, if you really wanted to. If I now plug those in, you'll see you get x equals 2e to the i pi by 2, or 2e to the minus i pi by 2, or 2e to the i 3 pi by 2, or 2e to the minus i 3 pi by 2, and so on. If I now simplify, and I recognize that e to the i pi by 2 equals i, then this is what I get. I get solutions 2i or minus 2i, 2i or minus 2i. And of course, as before, there's only two unique solutions. So there they are. And just for completeness, if you were to look at this as a polynomial, as we did with a previous example, solving x squared equals minus 4 is the same as solving x squared plus 4 equals naught, which can be written as x minus 2i times x plus 2i. So you get the same solution. Now let's put these on an argon diagram just for completeness. So let's look at x equals root 16. Then the solutions here are x equals plus or minus 4. So that's the square root of a positive number. And similarly down here, for the square root of 36, I could have plus or minus 4. If I'm doing the square root of a negative number, as I have here for y equals the square root of minus 9, I'll get y equals plus or minus 3i. And similarly for w, square root of a negative number, I get plus or minus 7i. Now let's put these on an argand diagram. So first of all, x, which was plus or minus 4. So you notice you have a solution here and a solution here. And you'll notice if I put in the real and imaginary axis, if I just emphasize those so you can see where they are, you'll notice there's a symmetry about the square roots. They're the same distance from the origin. They have the same moduli. And the phases are 180 degrees apart. Similarly for the z, where you had plus or minus 6, that's where the roots so the z went, and again you'll see there's that symmetry. They're basically in opposite, you, you go in a straight line through the origin and you get to the other root with the same moduli. What about things like y? And there the roots were plus or minus 3i. So let's mark those. And what do you notice here? Again, there's a sort of symmetry, isn't there? They've got the same moduli and they're 180 degrees apart. And similarly, if you look at w equals the root of minus 49, they were at plus or minus 7i. So you see the same sort of symmetry comes out again. So some conclusions. By thinking of a square root as an inverse operation, then the two solutions become obvious. So instead of trying to solve things like x equals the square root of a or x equals the square root of minus a, it's easier to solve problems of the form x squared equals a or x squared equals minus a. It then becomes obvious that for the square root of a positive number, you can have x equals plus or minus root a, or in exponential form, which ultimately can be more useful, the square root of a is the modulus, e to the i0 
gives you the phase. The square root of a is the modulus, e to the i pi gives you one possible phase. So you can see phases of naught or pi. If you're doing the square root of a negative number, you see you could write plus or minus j root a or i root a. Alternatively, you could extract the modulus, there it is, root a, and you could write the phase in the exponential form e to the i pi by 2, or e to the minus i pi by 2.